My name is Nika Cotton. I'm the owner of Soul Centricity Tea Room. I came up with the concept for Soul Centricity about five years ago. It was the first time I came up with the idea. When I first came up with the plan, I created this flyer and a logo and put it in a Google Drive and just kind of like listed out some things that I wanted to do, just sort of daydreamy, <laughs> really about it. But it was significant for me because it was at a really, really hard time in my life. I had gotten divorced, had to leave my, my house, two children, and couldn't really afford to keep up with the mortgage after I um, divorced from my husband. Ended up having to sell that house and just kind of went through like the, the hardest depression that I've ever experienced. You know, entrepreneurship for me was kind of a healing process, you know, because it was something to hope for. Something that kind of gave me some hope. This dream that I just came up with that, you know, at that time I was just like, okay, I might do this thing. Like I couldn't have even imagined. <laughs> it, you know, the way that it is now. Soul Centricity is a social business. Community organizing is at the heart of our vision to provide hope, healing, and restoration to the community we serve our offerings to. And it's essential, I feel like, as a black woman and an entrepreneur, that there is a social impact that my business has on the community I serve. We can't afford to not consider the needs of our communities in the ways that we create capital, and the ways that we build capital for ourselves. I'm creating a company culture because it's my hope over time to be able to French this concept and really create um, a business franchise that specifically speaks to black women because there really aren't any right now. Business culture is very masculine, very dominated, very white supremacist. It's all about competition, you know, kind of being better than other people and wiping them out. <laughs> concept where womanist business concept is all about collaboration and being able to pull people in, inspire people to see the vision that you have. Yeah, I think some of the historical trauma that the racial wealth gap creates for African-American business owners, uh, part of it is confidence. So we just don't have the confidence to even, you know, take the leap to start businesses sometimes because we don't know where we're gonna get that capital from to start. Also, in general, you know, coming to every sector of society, we feel like we're not qualified. We feel like we need to have way more than other people to just be good enough to do things. And so I think some of that internalizing, you know, the devaluation that we experience is the biggest effect of that trauma because it keeps us from doing things. It keeps us from starting things. It keeps us from showing up when we know we won't be perfect, even though statistically you have to fail over and over and over again to create a successful business. Like the people that make it are the people that fell a whole bunch of times. <laughs> and we don't have that room. We don't have the space for error, you know, we can't fail. We have to be twice as good. And so I think that is one of the biggest, we, you know, barriers to us even entering entrepreneurship is that fear, that fear of failing or just not even, not even the fear, like just not really having the financial space to try and fail. We are very innovative people and we really often don't have the opportunity to innovate. So the ways that I think oppression shows up against black um, business owners, I think first of all, access to capital. We really don't have access to you know, the same resources. We usually don't have the generational wealth because of the um, wealth and income gap in this country, there's a disproportionate amount of black people who don't have access to that. A lot of that has to do with historical segregation practice when it comes to lending. My great-great-grandparents weren't able to get loans for homes, <laughs> especially in, you know, decent parts of town. They don't have that wealth to pass down. And so some of the traditional means that people get access to capital, which is usually finding family that supports their startups, those sorts of things a lot of African Americans are not able to access capital that way. Another thing is usually our businesses are in the more African American parts of town and they're usually more economically, like historically economically disadvantaged parts of town due to redlining and other historical practices and policy practices. Even the property that we have, if we are able to own our businesses, doesn't have the same value allocated to it as businesses in other parts of town. And so we have that to contend with being devalued, you know, historically, economically, from a policy level. And then on top of that, once that value is added to our communities, which usually comes in the form of gentrification, and other people see, start seeing value in it and they move in, we usually get pushed out. We're not brought to the table 
to make those decisions. So we even see the kind of increase in value in the neighborhoods where our businesses are excluding us and you know pushing us out of those areas. Long-term policy decisions, like first of all, I feel like the four important things that any businesses need, especially black businesses, access to capital. And so policies that give black businesses access to capital and that favor black businesses in those decisions. And so sometimes we show up to the race with a little bit less than other people have because we've had to jump over hurdles. And so having economic policies that give us an, a leg up when we're coming to apply for capital. The resources, so access to locations. I really get access to this space just from kind of pounding the pavement and going out and talking to people and, you know, asking people if there were spaces available. And I talked to the landlord a couple, like a year and a half ago about this space and he remembered me and gave me and preferred me for access to this space. Leverage, we need either our own social networking organization so we're able to kind of leverage power and organize for ourselves so that when we see gentrification happening like it is a long truce, um, we have a say in how that's happening. We have spaces that are carved out for us. A lot of um, places that we see that have developed in our city and every city is like this, you know, they create create policies like no hoodies and no hats, right? No sagging pants, no white tees, no rap music. <laughs> but really what they're saying is black people are not welcome here into these spaces. They just don't have to say it, you know? And so really being able to have the influence to say, hey, like culturally we are people with value. We have spending power that is ridiculous. You know, and so we want to be valued in these spaces where we have historically lived, where our grandparents lived, where we, you know, historically um, had, you know, as the wealth starts to increase in those spaces, right? We want access to that, to the wealth that's increasing in these spaces that we've been, like we built this, <laughs> right? It was built on our, our work. And so we really need to be able to have the leverage to do that.